In just eight short lines, Tupac Shakur wrote a beautiful poem about conquering adversity called The Rose That Grew From Concrete. Now meet Nico Jenkins, also born of said concrete, but instead of becoming a rose, he was more like a weed that would rob that rose at gunpoint. Now by the end of this story, you'll see why he earned himself 450 years in prison and death. He was born on September 16, 1986 in Denver, Colorado, shortly after his family would relocate to Omaha, Nebraska, where the rest of this story will take place. And life was bad for him right from the jump. His parents, Lori Jenkins and David McGee, were both convicted felons from a long line of convicted felons with drug and alcohol addictions to top it off. For the majority of Nico and his five sisters' upbringing, they were left to fend for themselves. It was a tense situation for a child to grow up in, and one event would best paint the picture of his childhood. So when he was just four years old, he was sitting around playing when he heard his parents arguing, which in itself wasn't anything new, until it escalated into a full-blown physical altercation. He saw his father punch his mother as she tried to fight back. His instincts took over and he ran to them, crying, inserting himself in between his mom and dad mid-fight. And fortunately, it worked. The two parted ways but blood had already been spilt. They then yelled at Nico to clean it up. He gets some towels, and he does as he is told. A situation like that is intense for anybody, let alone a toddler, as the source of his ever-present anxiety most likely rooted from those early years. And this wasn't isolated to just Nico's immediate family. He was born into a large family tree of bad actors who at the time, like some unorganized family crime syndicate, were plaguing the entire city. Social services had to remove at least 20 children due to neglect or abuse. Police reports stacked tall and stretched as far back as 1979, connecting various family members to over 630 crimes. So let's fast forward a bit and begin with Nico's first contribution to his crime-ridden lineage. In 1993, a 7-year-old Nico brought and brandished a loaded 25 caliber handgun in his first grade classroom. This prompted his removal from that school, taken away from his mother and placed into a group home. He would then display a pattern of extreme behavioral issues from that point on. By the age of 8, he had gotten so bad, he was sent to see a therapist because everyone agreed there was just something fucking wrong with this kid. Surprisingly, Nico did open up in therapy. He said he was having suicidal thoughts because things were always just so tense for him and that he had just begun to wet his bed constantly, which he was ashamed of. It was also at this time he revealed that he heard voices in his head. Basically, that's what was causing me to have these, these, these outbursts because I had so much adrenaline coursing through my veins and then I had the stress hormone and I was depressed. I was getting beat. I was, you know, forced to do criminal stuff because of my demons. Or the voices back then, they would like, the demons would scare me at nighttime. Like, that's why I was so scared at night always, like as a child. Like, cause like if I didn't do enough bad stuff during the day, the demons and stuff would tell me they're going to get me at night. And I would literally feel them touching me, like touching me and shocking me, you know, making me pee on myself, like touching me. So he was diagnosed to be a possible schizophrenic and showed signs of being bipolar. But just knowing the cause didn't mean it solved anything if everyone did nothing. What they did do was kick him out of all his programs because of his violence and placed him in foster care. Now there, he simply found a new group of people to make uneasy. He once angrily chased a boy and tried to stab him with a knife, but one of his more egregious acts was using a metal clothes hanger to whip a boy so badly it left whip marks 
all over him. It wasn't long before he was removed from foster care and placed into a detention center. But nothing's going to change. He did his time and then is released back to the care of his mother, which of course was no care at all. By this time, he had dropped out of school and started hanging out in the streets. His environment kept him in a perpetual state of anxiety, and his anger just kept building alongside, unchecked. So now you have a kid wandering the streets, no supervision, no parental guidance, full of a deep-seated rage, and only knows violence as an outlet. So what does that equal? citizens getting harassed for just walking down the streets. He would use fear and intimidation to get what he wanted and would physically assault you if you didn't comply. He soon started robbing people at knife point and I have to point out all this before he was even a teenager. But by the time he was a teenager, he graduated from knives to guns, forcing his way into cars at gunpoint, telling the driver to get out and driving off with the car. His own father learned firsthand that nobody was safe when he found himself staring down the barrel of a shotgun because he said something Nico didn't like. And this was reported to the police, putting Nico on their radar for the first time. His reign of terror would finally come to a pause in 2003 when at just 17 years old, he was arrested for two armed carjackings and given 15 years in prison. Now while in prison, he decided to extend his stay a bit by inciting a prison riot and assaulting a prison guard, tacking on an additional five years for a nice round 20 year bid. But during his stay, he was thrown into solitary confinement for a mind-fucking 60% of the time. One stretch being a full two years. How in the world was that even allowed? It's almost no wonder that this man would start self-mutilating his face with razor blades. That this man now fancied drinking his own urine. But the one that takes the cake was that he was drinking and snorting his own semen because in his own words it was supplemental nutrition that helped calm his excessive anger and at some point in his stay he started worshiping an egyptian serpent god named apophis the lord of evil and darkness who has now terrifyingly taken over as the main voice in Nico's head. Now Jenkins is documented as having an IQ of just 69, which would leave him behind 98% of the population. But according to prison psychologists, he was a master manipulator and would go as far as to say that he was the most dangerous man he'd ever analyzed. So with all this troubling information logged and on file, does this sound like someone you would release? An inmate that is telling anyone that would listen that once he is set free, he will be right back to robbing people again. And now with Apophis by his side, he will kill someone. Maybe let him serve out his full 20 years for these kind of statements, you know, to get his mind right. Yes? And by this time, his face was now half tattooed and half mutilated. Just seeing his face alone should be enough to give the board pause, right? But no, after having served just 10 of his 20, on July 30th of 2013, he is set free. An unsupervised release, mind you meaning not even parole. So, you mean to tell us, an inmate that spent the majority of his time in solitary, meaning he is even too dangerous for the bad people, is pulled straight out of confinement and allowed to go walk amongst the good people? How does that make any sense? But it happened. So how did it work out? Well, it began well enough with a Nico release party thrown by his family in which he is given a shotgun as a gift. He would go on to use that shotgun to shoot two men in the face, killing both in an August 11th robbery. Jorge Caiga Ruiz and Juan Uribe Peña had driven their pickup truck to Spring Lake Park after being lured there by Nico's sister Erica Jenkins and their cousin Christine Bordeaux for sex. 
Instead, they meet Nico, who shoots Juan in the face. Jorge, who sees what just happened, brings his hands up to shield himself as another bullet rips through his hands and exited the back of his head. Nico turned their pockets inside out, checked the compartments of the truck, and fled the scene. Nico had no idea who these men were, but it showed how little he cared about human life at this point. Eight days later, on August 19th, Nico meets up with Curtis Bradford, a former cellmate of his, in order to commit a robbery together. They meet up on 18th and Clark, but what Bradford didn't know was that Nico didn't like him because he was associated with people that shot up Nico's sister's house a while back. That sister, Erica Jenkins, was there for the meetup also. She came up from behind Bradford and shot him in the back of the head. Nico, noticing Bradford was still moving, pulled out a shotgun, aimed it at his head, and ended it. Two days later, on August 21st, Jenkins and three relatives were scouting the neighborhood for an SUV to carjack. Why? Because the Little Wayne concert was in town. How does that make sense? Well, you see, if you had an SUV, it would make it easier to rob the people that were attending the Little Wayne concert. Flawless thinking. Andrea Kruger, a hardworking mother of three, after clocking out of her bartending job at 2 a.m., gets in her SUV and drives home. A little faster than normal tonight because one of her babies was sick. She finds herself at the corner of 168th and 4th Street where her path was suddenly blocked by Nico's relatives. And before she knew it, Nico had already opened her door and drug her out onto the street. He shot her in the back of the head, neck and spine and drove off with her vehicle. Andrea was left dead in the middle of that street. Nine days would pass, and on August 30th, the police would arrest Nico Jenkins, but on an unrelated charge of making terroristic threats to his ex-girlfriend, threatening to kill her and her family with the help of Apophis. Now, while they had Nico in jail, the police, who hadn't a suspect in the four murders yet, decided to look over their evidence in relation to this crazy looking guy they just arrested. Now the ballistics showed that it came from the same weapon, a shotgun, same ammo, and they did also possess CCTV footage of a person buying that ammo. They then made an extremely interesting find. They see that the man's name was Nico Jenkins, no stranger to the law. The person on camera buying the ammo was a Lori Jenkins. With some further digging, they soon enough learned that Lori was Nico's mother. Now that was definitely something they could work with. So on September 3rd, detectives decided to question Nico on this odd connection. And for some reason, maybe the serpent god was speaking through him. But he surely would not shut up. He started by denying the murders and segueing into a rant about his schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. How all he needed was help, but he was never given any by the state. And as he continued to ramble on and on, he touches on Apophis about the voice in his head that demanded blood sacrifices and slowly he starts to shed light on his knowledge of the murders but does not take any blame for them. I want you to understand something and I'm going to say this very clearly. I was not there. He starts by assigning blame to various family members. Snitching basically. And I'm going to give you from A to Z. This is not no goose chase. This is the real deal right here. That's why y'all don't even understand, man. I don't understand how hard this is for me right now. Because I'm portraying my family. Do you understand it? This is not just me. I understand one family is getting closer, you know. But I'm literally betraying my family and my bloodline. One being his own sister, Erica, for the murder of Curtis Bradford. Which the police would soon be able to connect Bradford to Nico as a former prison mate. The first tangible connection to Nico as the other three murders were random. FYI, this was an eight hour interview and his story just shifted and changed as it went on. I can only assume the detective's notepads were probably full of contradictions, nonsense, snitching, confessions. The voices made me do it. It was the correctional system's fault. It was my family's fault. Okay, I did it. Nope, just kidding. By the end of what looked to be an exhausting interview for all parties involved, 
detectives felt they had enough of a confession that they charged him with the four murders. Do you not realize I got Nico Jenkins? Do you not realize that? I got Nico Jenkins. I got you. What do you mean you got me? I got your DNA at the murder scene. I got your DNA in the car. Sir. I got the weapon. I got Nico Jenkins. So while awaiting trial, Nico files a lawsuit for $24.5 million against the state of Nebraska for letting him out of prison when he warned them that he would kill somebody. But of course, nobody took the lawsuit very serious, even though he kind of had a point. Nico then proceeds to write a six-page letter to the judge of how he is mentally unfit to stand trial due to his previously being diagnosed as schizophrenic, bipolar, and is now obsessive-compulsive disorder. The judge then orders a psychiatric evaluation in which he was deemed fit for trial because the psychiatrist felt he was making it all up and diagnosed him as only having antisocial personality disorder which I'm gonna go on a limb and say that he has also because I do believe that this man's brain is all types of broken and you probably don't need a degree to see it but to ignore his history of mental illness is rather disturbing I mean it was logged by other professionals colleagues since Nico was a child he's not making it up he's just reiterating what he's been told that he has now don't get me wrong there are parts where I am the sympathetic narrator, especially about toddler Nico, but nothing about Nico's past or mental illness gives him a pass for his violence. I believe a person like him should not exist in a society with decent folks, and he should be punished to the full extent of the law, in which he was on April 16 of 2014 in front of a three-judge panel. Now, Nico would turn this trial into somewhat of a circus when he fired his counsel and represented himself, starting off by giving details to all four murders and then denying that he was at fault for any of them, especially the brutal murder of Andrea Kruger because he says, and I quote, you can ask any woman in North Omaha, have I ever raised a hand at them? I haven't. Arguing that he wouldn't hurt a woman unless Apophis commanded him to do it. And then he would speak in tongues for all the courtroom to cringe. Tongues is basically uttering incomprehensible sounds. Supposedly, it's a language spoken through a mere mortal from a god. Gibberish is what it is. And the three judges were not amused as they slapped him with 450 years. Why so excessive, you might ask? Well... If he's possessed by an Egyptian serpent god, Lord knows when one of those things would die. So let's tack on the death penalty just in case. So Nico's 450 years began on May 30th of 2017. So what has become of him for the last five years up to this video? Has he already been executed? I looked him up in the Nebraska Department of Corrections website and... He's still in there. He's at the Tecumseh State Correctional Institution. Sentence is death, of course. It gives a list of his offenses and a little updated photo where we can see that he's gotten himself some even bolder face tattoos. He's due to have a parole board hearing in August of 2027. So that death penalty, we could assume isn't anytime soon. Quick side note. All family members that assisted Nico in his killing spree all received hefty sentences. Most notably, his mother Lori Jenkins got 20 years because the court believed she knew what Nico was going to use those bullets for. His sister Erica Jenkins received life for the shooting of Curtis Bradford. So that's the crazy case of Nico Jenkins. If you guys have any other subjects you'd like me to cover, please just leave it in the comment section and don't forget to like and subscribe. I hope you enjoyed the story, Dad. I love you, and I'll be back again soon with another.